welcome and thanks for, for hopping on to this call um, to have a, a talk through some things from a merchandise planning perspective that hopefully will be helpful to you in this interesting time. Um, I don't know um, how many people have had some exposure to merchandise planning previously. Um, you know, I often find that it's, um, it's something people maybe have heard of but don't know a lot about. Um, so I will touch on that. Um, just by way of a brief introduction, my name's Susan and I run a, a business called Smart and Planning, which is um, really taking my 25 years of planning experience and offering that as a service uh, to help businesses with their merchandise planning. My last employed role was over five years ago with the Cotton On Group where I headed up planning for the whole group globally. So that was a really fast paced and amazing experience. And um, the last five years I've been in the space, I've built a small team here in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, and we work with businesses from some quite um, small businesses all the way through up to some very large groups doing just about anything within in the merchandise planning space. So that's, that's me. And, um, and that's relevant because I'm now, going, <laughs> I'm now going to talk to you about stuff that is really very merchandise planning centric. Um, I'm going to try and not get terribly technical uh, because then I'll be the only one who's enjoying this. But um, I am going to try and cover a lot of information. And so um, if I'm going a little bit fast, then just shout and I'll slow down. But I, I, I want to try and cover a broad range of things because everybody's in such different situations at the moment. I mean, of course, there's a lot of you know, commonality, um, but everybody's circumstances are going to be slightly different. So I want to just try and throw out ideas and suggestions and examples. And hopefully there's something you can grab onto that'll make you uh, think about things as, you know, a little bit differently, spark an idea, you know, give you a strategy, something along those lines. So um, hopefully you don't have a headache by the end of it and, and hopefully I, um, I don't get too technical for you. But I will also try and remember to pause every so often and, um, and give you the opportunity to ask some questions if you'd like to or unpack that idea a little bit further or maybe there might even be some discussion within the group. Um, you know, that's also fine. So... Um, yeah, so I'll kick off then with um, starting with merchandise planning. What really is it? And like I was saying, often people, they may have heard of it um, or maybe they don't want to admit that they don't, they don't really know what it involves, that it's something a little bit scary over there that involves a lot of numbers. Um, and so that can make it a bit daunting and um, people can feel a bit out of their comfort zone and a bit lost with, with what am I supposed to do? Yes, merchandise planning, I've heard it's important. Um, and so I've got good news for you on that front, which is um, it's really actually not that, that um, heavy going. And um, the principles are really very common sense. And for yourselves on this call as founders, um, you've already got commercial acumen. That's what's got you started doing what you're doing. And all planning really does is overlay your gut feel with a framework and some benchmarks that help you harness and direct what you probably already sense. I find that happens a lot uh, when I'm sitting with different founders and business owners and they can talk to me about their business, they know what's going on, but they often land up saying, I don't, I don't really know for sure, but I, I feel like we're over, overstocked here for these reasons or we're encountering this problem for these reasons, but they don't have a way to really uh, prove it out um, and then take that further. And then once we start looking at it through some of that planning lens, uh, it confirms what they knew, but they feel a lot more confident in that because there's a little bit of science that's been brought to that. So, um, so like I said, I'm, I'm not gonna get terribly technical with it, but I do wanna cover some of the basics just to bring everybody to kind of the same level and not making assumptions about what you um, are and aren't familiar with. And um, that also then gives context to the areas that I'm gonna be focusing on um, as we chat. Um, so I'm going to start off with my very short definition. It's taken me many, many, many years to come up with a short definition. Uh, but the objective of merchandise planning is to maximize sales and maximize profit through optimizing inventory. So, you know, that's as, as simple and, um, and yeah, short as I can make it. Um, so really, in other words, planning is just about getting the most out of your stock, how it's invested, how it's flowed and traded, uh, so that you can achieve the most profitable outcomes with that. And so right now, experiencing what we are, the focus really, from a planning perspective, needs to be on stock um, today and into the future. 
So I suppose um, just at that point there, is everybody kind of comfortable and okay? I'll, I can only see two faces on, on my screen at the moment. So if you two guys nod, that's all good for me. Um, okay, yes, and some comments coming through, great. So what I thought we would do is just think of things, um, retail in its simplest terms, the retail cycle. So not the one on the left, but the one on the right. So we all know that the retail cycle comes down to buy, move and sell our merchandise. And that's a repeating cycle. And ideally what we're trying to do is make sure that what we sell it for is more than what we bought it for, plus all the associated costs of being in business. And then that's when we actually make a profit. So when it comes to merchandise planning, it's really just adding a little bit more um, activities to each of those steps. And so that looks something like this. We start with a strategy, which I'm sure you do as well. And for some of you, it might be um, uh, journaling <laughs> in a really nice notebook. And for some of you, it might be something in a, in a whiz bang file and something you sat and discussed with your business partner or your bank manager. Um, but normally there's a strategy of some sort, which then um, we translate into a, a plan, a merchandise financial plan. That gets broken down um, into an open to buy and uh, formulates the range that then, you know, either gets allocated to stores or to stockists. Uh, we then trade that product, uh, selling it to the, to the customer. Uh, along the way, there are probably going to be some markdowns. And we also then review what happened and take those learnings and re-inform that strategy. So again, that cycle just repeats. And ideally, along the way, we're making some profit. So the activities that planning is really focused on around that outside um, cycle there, again, they, they focused on stock decisions, they, they focused on how do we use the stock most optimally, so what to buy, how much, what price, where to send it, when to reduce the price, what to reduce it to, all of those sorts of things. The only one I think that might be um, a little bit more foreign as a concept is this one over here, which is the merchandise financial plan. Um, and so I'm going to unpack that one just very, very simply and briefly. But again, just to give you that sort of context for some of the other um, conversation that we're going to have. And that merchandise financial plan, um, it really is just a financial expression of your business or product strategy. That's all it is. It's just telling that story of what you plan to do using numbers and KPIs so that you can take a step back and evaluate it in more measurable and objective terms. It gives you a running track. And importantly, it's not a fixed thing that's locked in and, and can't be changed. It remains fluid. And as you get new information, so your plan can be updated and, um, and it remains dynamic in that way. So we're just telling the business story in numbers and it's dynamic. And so an analogy that I came up with that I think um, you know, gives you a good understanding of it is if you think of Google Maps, um, it's really a very familiar process what a merchandise plan is. You know, when you, when you hop in your car and you use Google Maps to help you navigate, you choose a destination, you might even specify, you know, some of your um, conditions regarding the, the route that you choose. You might want to stop off somewhere along the way. You might want to avoid tolls, whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, you're trusting Google Maps to lead you along the most efficient path, get you to your destination, and also to dynamically change along the way to avoid a traffic jam. Uh, but you trusted to keep you on track and um, your merchandise financial plan. And I know that a lot of you might not have something in those formal terms, but conceptually that's, that's all that is. And um, it, um, it's a roadmap with KPIs. So it gives you your sales, your margin, your stock all in one place over an extended period of time, which is giving you some visibility into the future. And that's as technical as I'm going to get. It gives me good vibes thinking about that stuff, but I'm going to move on from there now. Again, I'll just have a very quick pause because now we're going to move into some things about what to be doing now. Uh, but is there anything anybody wants to clarify on what I've covered so far? I'll keep a little eye on the chat box. Okay, so moving on to what to do now. With the context um, that I've covered, which are the things that I love to obsess over, we've got to now think about, okay, the circumstances we find ourselves in, 
and knowing that stock and profitability are going to be the focus of anything that I'm really bringing to the table. Um, we found ourselves in a situation where retail as a whole is in a lot of pain. Um, yes, there are some product areas that have been doing very well, uh, but others have had a significant drop off. And you know, we've seen substitutions as well, um, product areas that maybe people didn't expect would do well in these times, suddenly we realize, oh yes, there is a need for that from home. Um, but um, I, I've heard cases where businesses have dropped off 80%, um, and, and there's probably you know, things either side of that. So um, we know that uncertainty is affecting the customer sentiment at the moment. We know that their finances are under pressure um, and that they are, in many cases, focusing their spend on uh, non-discretionary items, which does put a question mark around fashion and whether that is a necessity. Oh my goodness, the burning question we've all <laughs> said is, is fashion a necessity? Of course it is. Um, but it is feeling a little bit of pain at the moment. Um, across the fashion sector, um, of course, there's a lot of discounting as businesses are trying to uh, still move through their product. And, and that you know, takes up what is already a fiercely competitive environment and makes it even more difficult to navigate. Um, so because stores are closed, um, even though online has picked up for a lot of businesses, it's not enough to compensate. And, um, and, and as I've mentioned, there's the competition due to discounting. So I believe that quite a few of you are running your own um, e-store, um, some of you with uh, a couple of bricks and mortar stores as well, or with stockists. Um, and so I'm imagining you might have had some orders cancelled and uh, that you're sitting with stock that you're not really sure that you're going to be able to sell through it in, in the relevant season and in the time periods that we have. And we've got a lot of unknowns as to when uh, business will return to normal and what normal will look like. Um, so in addition to that sort of depressed demand from a sentiment um, and a financial point of view and the heightened competition, we've just got this smaller channel to, to move our stock through. So smaller sales is resulting in, in an in a overstock position. So we need to establish what this means for our stock. And in the same way that, you know, if you're starting on a fitness journey, you need to know what is your starting point now and, and then where you want to go. We're going to do the same thing in terms of thinking about your stock. Um, and start off by figuring out what we what what situation are we in right now. Um, bearing in mind through this um, this next section that your stock is either an asset or a liability, and um, and for any business it's one of the biggest um, assets uh, that that um, that's sitting on their books. And the the challenge with with stock is that it can quite quickly turn into a liability, and so it's really important to stay on top of that and to have some strategies for what to do. So my focus is really around looking at managing that cash flow, creating opportunities to turn your stock back into cash um, so that you can create open to buy for the upcoming period. Um, so again, the situation is going to be different for everybody who's listening, uh, depending on your product type and how you were tracking when things slipped into the COVID situation that we're in. Um, so some people might have done extremely well selling through their summer stock and they don't have any overhang of summer. Other people um, might not have received their winter stock yet and maybe they had some options to uh, cancel it or, or reduce volumes. Um, so everybody's going to be somewhere slightly different. Some people early on might have actually been scrambling to get their winter stock in, only to then go, oh no, wait, I've changed my mind. Turn the, turn the boat around, turn the ship around. I don't want it anymore. Um, so everybody's probably got you know, something in that nature that they're dealing with. Um, but I guess what we need to do now is really just take stock of that. So we need to know what is it? What is the stock that you're holding? Um, and by that, I mean, think about it from a fashionability point of view. Uh, you know, what is at the really pointy end of fashion? And, and does that mean it's going to date? Because that puts it in a high risk category. Um, where does it sit from a seasonality point of view? Again, the more extremes from a seasonality point of view can, can infer more risk. Um, but maybe you've got some, some good basics and evergreens in your range, in which case you probably don't need to take as, um, as quick or as dramatic action uh, just because there's frenzy and chaos and panic around you. Maybe you don't need to participate. So you don't need to just sort of get swept along with all of that. Um, the other thing to take into consideration is, is the age of your stock, where your size profile is sitting, if you've got already a fragmented 
uh, size range. Um, all of those things are, are important to consider in terms of what do you actually own. So I encourage you to take, your, take a look at your stock and segment it so you can get a read on that and then look at how much is sitting in each of those buckets. Um, and by how much, I'm really talking about the volume, you know, how many units and what does it translate to in, in value? Um, and where is it? So, you know, do you own it? Is it sitting in a 3PL? Is it out in your, your stores or stockists? Um, is it on order, which effectively does still mean you own it if you just don't have your hands on it yet, but from a financial point of view, you are committed to it and have some obligation there. And then the next, the last point there is what is it worth? And I'll revisit this a little bit later on, but it is a really important um, thing to, to work through. And it's different to how much do you have? So by that, I mean, if it's already aged or if it's in one of those high risk segments, uh, or if your size range is already broken, the question of what it's worth is probably less than its ticket value. And even if you have a lot of it, and it's not something that you would normally then think um, should be going through to markdown because it still has a lot of potential in it, I'm going to revisit this, but I really urge you to start thinking about it in terms of what is its true selling potential. Because you really need to have a clear read on that to understand how well is it going to support you, whether, whether trade picks up again in the next month, six weeks, uh, whether it's two, three months or longer, and, and you know things are starting to look a little bit more encouraging, but we just don't know. Having a really clear understanding of your stock and creating some scenarios as to if you continue trading at the same rate and things kind of pick up in, in six weeks or eight weeks, what will that mean for that stock profile? How much will you've worked through? And how will your buckets have changed of what is good saleable stock for that time period versus what is potentially problem stock? And stay on top of that because Having that good stock read and understanding of what can it actually do for you from a productivity point of view is going to help you make decisions which are going to be quite um, uh, frugal decisions about what can you invest next. So you don't want to um, over assume what your stock can do for you. Think that you don't need to invest much more in a new range offering and that when things sort of return to normal, the stock that you've got will be okay. Maybe it won't you need to put a really good lens against it and figure out if it will, because otherwise when everything does go back to normal and stores are open and people are out shopping, if you haven't been honest with yourself about your stock, it's not gonna work for you then. So that's the evaluation process that I encourage you to, to work through at the moment. Um, and that will help you determine what is the most correct course of action at different time frames into the future. Our next step is assessing options. So, you know, some of them, I'm sure you've already laid awake at night thinking about, um, you know, some of them I'm sure you've already had conversations about. Of course, the obvious ones where you have an overstock, if it's not here yet, is options to cancel or reduce your orders, to push them out and flow them slightly differently, uh, speaking to your suppliers about holding fabric or repurposing fabric. Um, of course, you've got your markdown lever, but bearing in mind that its effectiveness is obviously a bit different now because so many people are pulling that lever. Um, I don't normally recommend um, putting away stock for another season, but these are not normal times. Um, I certainly would encourage you wherever you have um, the option to, to put something away and bringing it up, bring it out next season when it's seasonally relevant again. If it's not going to be um, damaging to your brand, if it's not going to be, um, you know, such a relevant stock that actually it didn't hold any value through that time, then do that. Certainly look after your core and your basic product. Um, there are also considerations around what can you do to refresh your product. So sometimes uh, you can bring something out a little bit later on, you can add some new colors and, and um, newness to it, and you can actually refresh it. And if it hasn't hit the market, it'll still be fine. Um, and of course, there are options around donating stock, um, writing it off, you can consider you know, aggregators and, and marketplaces, those are all, um, all options for where to um, move your stock out to. But unfortunately, there's no silver bullet when everybody's in the situation of potentially having an overstock. Um, there's, there's not a lot of places to go. It's about tailoring this to your personal circumstances and going, what are the levers that I could pull that are going to be appropriate to that profile of stock that I've identified? 
but there are quite a few of them. And, um, and I do think that potentially a combination of them will give you a little bit of breathing space. Key to all of this though, is of course your relationships, um, you know, with your, with your suppliers and with your stockists and of course your, your, your direct customer um, through your websites. Um, so it's really worth focusing on what ties you together, what helps you build a bridge, where are your lifelines? Some of these actions can't be taken alone, on, taken alone. Um, and so the, the good relationships, good communication is really going to be vital um, with all of those partners and try to identify what are the mutually, benef mutually beneficial arrangements that you can put in place um, and try and get on the front foot. So um, it's very human to avoid having the hard conversations, um, but it's something that is worth doing, preparing for some of those what if scenarios having some conversations, open and transparent conversations where you can troubleshoot things together. What if we did this? And that might spark some other ideas and you can create a solution together. But what you probably can be sure of is that it's either going to be mutually assured survival or mutually assured destruction somewhere in those relationships. So it's really worth finding the partnership and, um, and finding a balance there. So in terms of your um, suppliers, it's a good time obviously to be reassessing that supply base, looking at where any vulnerabilities are, you know, obviously not um, finding yourself maybe caught with only one supplier or with a supplier where you're not important enough to them, what are your alternatives? Um, it's also a good time to be revisiting your critical path. So by that, I mean, you know, really inspecting that to go, what is the latest time that you can cut fabric? What is the latest time that you have to dye up your fabric? Um, what are those last, last moments that you can make those decision points that lock you in? The later you can make them, the more informed you're going to be and the better decisions that you're going to make. So often critical paths do have a little bit of, um, a little bit of fat in them. So it's worth yeah, unpacking them and having a really good look at all of those steps and figuring out where can you buy some time back? Um, how can you be more nimble on that critical path? And, um, and perhaps, you know, there's an expression, give your best to your best. Work more with those suppliers um, or manufacturers that are going to give you more flexibility um, who are prepared to be nimble with you and give you that um, extra breathing space. Um, you can also look at the actual phasing of your stock and whether um, you can change the uptake of your stock. Maybe they will hold more of it for you for longer and you can call off smaller, uh, smaller bites of stock and that might be a way to manage some of your cash flow through the process. Um, I also think it's worth um, spending a little bit of time on, on capacity planning. So again, I don't know where you're getting your um, your production um, done, whether it's local, whether it's um, with some of it's overseas, but when production really kicks into gear again, some of the normal phasing and flow is going to be interrupted. You know, the factories are real masters at scheduling their production, squeezing, the, you know, the, the, smaller, um, the smaller runs in between their big ones. And, and so they work out what's most efficient and most productive for them. When all the different retailers switch back on, they're going to be switching back on in a bit of a scattered pattern. And so I think even the suppliers are going to have a little bit of an adjustment period, figuring out how they fit it all in. But they're probably going to be reluctant to say no to anything. So you could still experience some delays and interruptions to when you thought your stock was going to come. Um, and um, so again, it's some, it's, I don't have a... Um, an answer for it other than to get on the front foot with it and have some conversations to really try and get a read on that and um, have the conversations with those suppliers to try and fit into their production planning, understand when your product can be um, manufactured. And also to be aware that there might be some shifts in your MOQs, um, your minimum order quantities, uh, the volumes that different suppliers are prepared to work with. And that potentially if yours are smaller volumes, you might fall to the bottom of a priority queue. So again, being on the front foot, not getting sort of caught by surprise by some of those things, but actually initiating a conversation and trying to um, give them a good read of when you think you're going to be uh, needing to place your orders, receive your orders. And um, if you're in first, maybe you'll be best dressed. Um, and again, maybe there's some opportunities to, to 
partner up or buddy with some other um, some other retailers um, or wholesalers, some other smaller businesses where maybe there is some common fabric and maybe you can pull your volume to get a little bit more buying power to combat what might be coming in the way of price changes, which I'll touch on in a moment as well. So again, those, those relationships and those alliances are worth really exploring. Um, when it comes to your, your stockists um, or, um, or your own retail stores, but um, certainly with stockists, when it comes to taking markdowns, um, there might be some legal obligations there that you need to work through. Um, you know, what's in your contract versus what they're actually doing and what they're okay for you to do in terms of timing of markdowns on your own site and what it means for the brand. Again, those are all conversations that need to be had. Um, there might be some option and whether this is, you know, with your own stores or whether um, your product is sitting with stockists, there might be some options to recall product to then recycle it. By recycle it, I don't mean recycle it and put it through some big grindy uppy machine. I mean reuse it repurpose it into, into the future because you can bring back your, your volume, you can bring reconsolidate your size range and then potentially use it more productively later on. So that is a little bit of a, um, a two-way street where you might take a little bit of pressure off some of your stockists by saying, let me take that range back. I know this is not the right season for it. I know it's not the statement you need to be making at the moment. Let me take it back. Behind the scenes, you might have to take some, um, have some financial conversations and put some things in place. But then you don't have to reinvest in that stock again. You can have an agreement that they're effectively going to buy it back from you at a time that is more suitable for them. And then that doesn't become dead stock for you. Um, there might be some options to do some swap outs. So, you know, what's a bestseller for you when you sell your stock to a retailer might not be a bestseller for them or, or not yet. Um, or they might be getting different reads with it. So if you can get in touch with how is something performing for them, um, you might also find that you can redistribute it a little bit. You know, as a retailer, normally, um, there would be some rebalancing of stock between stores. And that might not be a consideration as much for, um, for somebody who's running a brand and is, has sold their stock on to, um, to stockists. But maybe there is a little bit of redistributing there, which means that your product isn't dragging somebody down and maybe you can continue feeding a channel that is working. Pre-orders definitely should give you a little bit more, more security or at least if, if businesses aren't in a position to place those pre-orders, certainly encouraging them to work with you on forecasting what their needs might be. Um, I do find that that's often quite a loose uh, setup where you know it's nice to get forecasts but we don't always get them. But working together and trying to get something a little bit more solid in place is definitely going to help you with your own planning, having a read of what do they think um, they're going to want from you and when. Um, of course, deposits go some way, although I think most people are probably going to hold on to those pretty tight right now. Um, and collaborations, you know, what can you do to leverage off each other? So maybe yourself and, and your stockist haven't done terribly much together. They are simply more of an outlet. Maybe some of them don't have as... Um, as ramped up or advanced of an of an e-commerce platform. And so they don't get to speak to their customers terribly much that way, but maybe there's something you can do more in collaboration. Maybe you have those customer channels. Um, they maybe have some of the customer lists, bring them together and get a little bit more leverage out of your combined uh, footprint. So again, it's it comes down to um, a little bit of thinking um, creatively there, which I won't spend a lot of time on on this next slide, but um, it is a time to get creative and we've seen a lot of examples of it already in, in other um, industries. Um, but I suppose the concept here is, is think about how can you use your stock as marketing material. And a good example for that is you take a giant like the Cotton On Group. And uh, when, I, when I first started working with them, uh, you know, there were times that I would say, oh, you don't need that much stock that, you know, you're not going to necessarily power through all of those sales. But what I came to realize with that business was um, they, don't, you know, they don't advertise, but their stores are part of that advertising statement. They, they create amazing theater and stores. They, they create an amazing um, call to the customer at the lease line. And some of the stock is paying the price of that marketing. So they needed to make a certain statement and they're prepared to put that little bit extra investment into their stock, even if it won't turn quite as quickly as what some of their thresholds might be but it's actually taking up some of the marketing cost, if that makes sense, that there's that trade-off there. So I think if you think through that, um, through that lens a little bit, 
how can you actually, if you own the stock anyway, and if it's losing value anyway, at some point there's a question of, can I, can I think of this as through a marketing uh, lens instead? Um, and whether that's, you know, more freebies to influencers, whether you, um, you know, take up one of a, a charitable cause with it, you know, donate some, some nice woolly scarves to some nurses who are up early in the winter mornings, um, whether you do gifts to your VIP customers, just in the same principle as, you know, sometimes it's just nice to come home um, and, and get a bunch of flowers when it's not your birthday, it's not your anniversary and no one did anything wrong, but you just get a bunch of flowers. Um, you know, some of that stock is not going to be productive for you. It's not going to work for you. At some point, you might end up needing to write it off. Have a look at it and see, are there some people who have just been amazing supporters of your business? No, maybe they don't have a big Instagram account, but they've been there for you and you can send them something to go, I know this is a tough time for everybody and we're thinking of you and here's something that we think you'll like in your size, enjoy it. So clothing rental, you know, there are clothing rental businesses out there, maybe start a conversation with one of them. Can you, can you offload some of your stock to them that they can use through their business? Or maybe can you set up something temporarily with your own where at least you get to cycle some of that stock through a few times, get some value back on it before you need to um, write it off or mark it down to terminal. Um, and again, you know, there's lots of things going on out there, people dressing up to take out their rubbish bins, uh, people having Friday night drinks on Zoom. Uh, just think creatively as to how can you get involved with that? Can you sponsor something that people are wearing to, to that event? Can you invent an event and, and have a reason for people to, to dress up? So all of those things are just trying to find more ways and create more marketing opportunities for your stock rather than have it sitting still. Um, the thing to remember here, though, um, with all of these ideas and, and suggestions is both holding stock and moving stock cost money. So um, whether, whether the consolidation option is an option and what that might look like, um, or whether you're holding onto the stock in a 3PL, um, unless it's in your back room, maybe, um, holding it and moving it cost money. So you, you really do want to have... Um, costed that out and have a strategy for what you're doing. Um, okay, so moving on to what to do next. Um, while we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty um, on so many fronts, there are things that you can be doing to, to plan forward and, and think about how you're gonna approach your ranges moving forward. Um, from a merchandise planning position, of course, still the focus remains on inventory and profit. So, um, what I'm encouraging you to do as we sort of step through these next few items is um, think about how you can make your cash go further and um, minimizing your risk and your exposure with your next range that you're putting together. Again, we don't know what those timeframes might be, but as you work through your range construction, um, some of the things that you can be thinking about when it comes to width, um, maybe you can do just slightly less options than you normally would. It doesn't have to be the same that you've always done. Um, hone in on what you really need, what you really stand for and prioritize those things. When it comes to depth, um, again, you can move to more of a sellout model perhaps than you have before. You know, it's very normal within retail to have some little remainders that move into a markdown cycle at some point. But you don't have to. Um, go that deep with your quantification. You don't have to put that many units behind something. You can um, sell out. You can create a little bit of FOMO and retrain your customers to getting in fast. And when they're trying to decide am I buying this or that, that they need to buy the this with you first because it's not gonna be there after that. So you can just pull back on that depth a little bit and be prepared to sell out. It's a little bit of a different strategy because um, often when you are a growing business, um, and it would be quite true for a lot of startups, when you're on that growth trajectory, you need to allow a little bit more stock to allow you to explore your potential of your sales at each next step. These circumstances, I think, are a little bit different. And rather than giving yourself that extra stock for the growth, it might be a little bit safer in the short term, you know, when things are just getting going again, to pay a little bit more cautiously. Um, then when it comes to your size ranges, 
um, depending on you know whether you whether you start at a six and go up to a 16 whatever that size range is that you service um, it might be worth trimming the edges so maybe you don't do those fringe sizes in your next collection or maybe you don't do it on all of your styles um, you know maybe you always varied a little bit based on fit but you can be a little bit more uh, again um, discerning with what you include and when it comes to your size curve as well, maybe you shift those a little bit and double down even more on your most popular sizes. So why I'm, why I'm describing these things is because I'm trying to find ways to make your money work harder for you in the areas that it's really going to hit, where it's really going to matter. And knowing that, um, or assuming that uh, the financial situation for most retailers going forward is going to be quite strained because they haven't yet, re yet released the cash from their winter buy, but they need that cash to buy their summer. I'm trying to find ways for you to need less money to still make that summer range get off the ground. Um, similar thinking around your colors, you know, maybe where you previously might have offered four colors, maybe three will do it. Um, and also um, be conscious of, of trialing newness and not going too over the top with things that are unproven because it's not going to be a good time to be left with overstocks when you've just relaunched and when everybody's out there being excited about the shopping experience for the first time in a long time. Um, it's just not a great time for you to, to have missteps and, and too much um, unproven um, color, color ways and, and those sorts of things in your offer. Um, some businesses also might be offering sort of more fringe products. So maybe you have some intimates that you include in your offer or some footwear or some accessories. If they're non-essential to your brand position, um, you might want to just drop them off for the moment. If they're a little bit more high risk, certainly um, footwear can be a tricky one because it's just bulkier, um, but also because it tends to be more size intensive. Um, those, those products that are very size intensive are stock hungry because in order to offer them and actually get any real um, return on them, you need to, you know, you're not going to sell just one of each size. You, you still need to bulk them up, but there are more sizes and so they attract more of the stock investment. So some of those things where you know they're size hungry, um, if they're not absolutely critical to your business, you know, maybe do less of them or just, just drop them in the short term and you can pick them up again later. Um, other ways to de-risk your range, um, again, to play it a little bit safer in, in the seasonality space. So a little bit more trans-seasonal type offers, um, a little bit less of a commitment to the, um, to the extremes and, um, prioritizing your core or your basic product, um, you know, with your dollars and with your communications, really making that, um, it, it's still going to be what you stand for. It's still going to be true to your brand. Uh, you don't want to be just so vanilla that you stand for nothing. Um, but within the, the context of your own range, um, focus in on those things that are a little bit more evergreen, that if they don't take off at the rate you thought initially, that they're not going to be a burden from a stock point of view. Um, and of course, you can always actively look for ways to re-merchandise older stock to give it new life. And I touched on that before, drop in a new colorway um, and, um, and see if you can freshen it up there. So those are some of the things from a, a stock management perspective and a ranging perspective and trying to spread your dollar further um, that other businesses are doing at the moment and that you can think creatively around. Um, before I move on, um, again, are there some specific questions? I'm just having a little quick look at the chat box. Um, okay, so how do you get rid of age stock without hurting your brand? And just in time manufacturing. So just in time manufacturing, yes, I think um, if I'm understanding that as a question or a suggestion, yes, the, the, the latest you can leave it and bringing it in just as you need it um, is, a, is a great way to go. Um, how do you get rid of aging stock without hurting your brand? It's a really delicate balance. I'm not sure that I have the answer. Um, the... I think probably, you know, I started off talking about strategy and I do think it's still really, really important to, um, to keep that at the center of what you do. And, and part of that is your brand identity. So I do think it is, it's very important to protect that. Um, 
And I suppose the question is maybe to ask yourself with that stock, you know, not knowing your business, but with that, um, with that stock aging, what is the criteria by which you're determining that it's aging? Because, and I don't mean this in a um, uh, diminishing fashion point of view, um, but perhaps the criteria by which you think it is now aged or um, not wanted or valuable to the customer customer might be slightly different to where they would draw that line. And I actually think we might find that they are going to be more forgiving with some of that than they previously would have been. Um, okay. I've made way too much product first collection and it's not as good as what I make now. Okay. So it's by your standards, it's not as good. And probably by the read that you're getting, it's not as good, but, um, but you don't want to damage the brand now and exiting it. I'm going to circle back to that. I don't have a perfect answer for it and I'm not going to pretend that I do, uh, but I'll circle back to it. Okay. And it's quite aged. All right. We might, um, we might take that offline and I might um, look at it with you separately if that's okay, Lindsay. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. So I'm going to move forward then on to talking about pricing for a little bit. So again, this is just about getting you on the front foot for some of the dynamics that are potentially going to shift. So um, pricing can be impacted on different levels um, with what we're working through now. Um, and it's important to be tuned into them because they, it's, it's directly relevant to profit. So there's every chance that you might find cost prices might increase because your suppliers and manufacturers have been through pain, have missed a step and are trying to now recover. There will be um, some lost efficiency in the operation. And that could be pushed through to you as cost prices, cost price increases. Um, your option with that obviously is, is retail increases to maintain your margin between your cost and, and your retail. And um, some of that I think is going to be inevitable. There's a lot of talk about the inflation that will that will follow after um, after this period that we're going through. The thing to bear in mind, however, is that um, there is still going to be a lot of fierce competition out there. And so I'm not sure that it is the right time to move your retail pricing. And um, the other thing to bear in mind is that if you do, you might sell less units. There tends to be that trade-off between retail price and unit volume. And so you're really going to need to try and find that sweet spot between those cost price shifts, what you can absorb, um, whether you need to adjust your retail pricing, and also um, bearing in mind some foreign exchange movements that might be happening there. So um, shifts between the Australian and US dollar are going to, to have an impact. And if you are supplying any international markets, those currencies might also have shifted, in which case those retail prices might need to be reassessed. So um, it's not to say that there's a, um, a one size fits all answer in that it's more about preempting being on the front foot with it and having a good understanding of what can you and can't you um, tolerate or manage, excuse me, <coughs> in terms of your margin, because that margin has to support all of your below the line operating costs. And so um, before you go and commit on a range, having that understanding of where those cost and retail price shifts have, have moved to and what does that leave you in the way of margin, you might need to rework some of those numbers um, to get your bearings again. Do you need to have a sip of water? Excuse me one sec. Okay. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, I will caution you as well, though, in terms of preserving margin, preserving margin and not taking markdowns. One moment. <coughs> I'm not unwell, just so you know. <clears throat> but once I get the tickle in my throat, it doesn't stop. Okay. Not taking markdowns when they're due can be quite um, damaging and can turn into a worse problem over time. Can translate into an age stock problem that becomes too difficult to deal with later on. So 
while I'm encouraging you to obviously think about your profitability and manage your pricing to deliver that, it also, the counter to that of not taking markdowns and not recognizing when something needs to move on is a risk. And so you need to find that balance as well. Um, <clears throat> of course, if your margin is getting squeezed between your retail and your cost, then the only other place to go is reviewing your operating expenses and costs. There might also be some things that you can do in terms of renegotiation and getting on the front foot, anticipating or initiating conversations around terms and um, what, you, what you're going to need, identify in advance, what are you going to need, go into that conversation with a clear view already. It's not just a case of working back from, from your retail price and then your supplier tells you, oh, well, then your cost price is this. Have a good understanding from your own point of view of what you need your cost price to be to, to, to give you enough profitability between that and the retail that you know is the right um, perceived value that you're going to position your product to your customer. Being prepared, I think, for some of those conversations is, is a big part of the negotiation um, so that you're on the front foot and you are more in control. And then when you do take markdowns, being clear on why you're taking them, not just defaulting to them, not just being swept along, like I was saying before, with the frenzy in the marketplace and because everybody's doing it, you're doing it too. Take a really uh, measured approach, really think about your own offer, really think about, really look at your numbers and see how, how your product's performing and don't participate if you don't need to. Um, of course, type links to your marketing messages so that where you are you know, putting your marketing spend, you can back it up with the inventory to, um, to also not disappoint your customers. Um, okay, so moving on to measures. I've listed here some of my sort of, um, I guess, recommended measures for these times, measures or KPIs or how to evaluate performance. Um, one of my favorite things, and it's a really easy one to work with, is mixed percent. So, you know, simply taking, you know, whether it's your, just taking your range and, and Rubik's cubing it. So you might take your, your, um, your styles and your options and add up all of your sales by color and, you know, into your different color groups, um, add up all of your stock into your different color groups, add up your margin into your different color groups and express them as a percentage mix or percentage contribution. So, you know, if just to make it very, very simple, if black represents, you know, 60% and yellow represents 20% and blue represents the other 20%. So that might be what your profile is from a sales mix point of view. But then when you evaluate your stock mix, you might find that your black is only at 40% of your stock holding and that you know, yellow and blue are making up a much higher remaining percentage. And straight away from that, you can start to get a read of how your black is overperforming. And when you start thinking about what you're gonna commit next, you might re, you know, put more effort into your black, more, more investment into your black to, to top that back up and stay in step. And I like to do it across sales, stock and margin because that will really help you zoom in on where your profitability is coming from. It's a really quick and simple little um, analysis to do, and you can do it on just about anything. You can do it on fabrication. You can do it on sleeve links. You can do it on just about any attribute of your range. Um, and like I say, it just gives you a really quick read so that you can understand how things are performing that can inform your markdown decisions. And it also helps you then think about with the next investment that you're gonna make, what do you wanna emphasize? In these times as well, um, and as, you, as we sort of move through, I think trend measures are going to be really valuable. So as opposed to your traditional refer to last year or refer to a budget, um, your trend measures are the ones that are just showing you how are you progressing? Are you on, a, on an upward curve? Are you holding steady? Are you still in a decline? So it's just measuring that rate of sale week on week or your drop-offs or, um, or growths on the previous month. So if you can just go going from March into April or whether it's, you know, June into July, of course, there'll be some seasonality, but monitoring that step change week on week or month on month and trying to see a progression over time in the now, as opposed to having to rely on last year, will give you a better read for the moment on how you're doing. 
I love sell through. I've always loved sell through. One of the things I love about it is um, it's a great leveler. It doesn't really matter uh, whether you um, had a lot or a little because when you compare things based on sell through, you are making them comparable. Um, so the rate at which you sell through um, your black dress, if you bought 20 of them and you've sold 10 of them, you've sold through for 50%. Um, you might have bought 100 units of something else and sold through only 30%. And you can compare them even though they're quite different volumes and you can see which one is working faster. Of course, the volume comes into it at some point, but you're probably not going to have such disparate numbers across your business and it just gives you a good way to compare which things are taking off quickly. Normally a sell through will give you an indication very quickly of whether something's working. And again, when our numbers are going to probably change from what we're used to seeing, that's a way for you to be able to tell quickly the rate of your sale relative to your stock holding is, is a good way to go. Um, I had a note in there about relational measures and by that I simply mean ones that, that involve sales and stock or sales and margin. Um, again, because we, we've just got such moving and shifting times that I think bringing all of your measures together and getting you know, stock turns and forward covers, if you have a forward sales plan, they give you more of a read of where you're going. Um, I personally, I love forward cover. Um, and percentage change is still relevant. I, I, I don't think you should be chucking away your history. I do still think it's worth tracking how are you comparing to last year or how are you comparing to a budget? I would just de-emphasize some of the decisions I would make from that at the moment until you are in a clearer uh, space again. Um, okay, so principles. Um, okay, so I guess the main thing that I wanna convey here is, is keeping it real. Um, and it's important to do in terms of both sales and stock. And, um, and that's why I chose that little picture on the side there, because we do see what we want to see. And we, um, it's easy to, you know, when you have your own business and, and when, you're, when you're putting yourself out there through your product, of course you have to have believed in it because otherwise you wouldn't have done any of it. And, and because of that passion and because of that vision, it can sometimes be hard to separate um, some of the, realism is maybe too harsh of a word, but I'll use it for now, for speed. When it comes to planning your stock um, and how much stock to buy, that really needs to start with planning your sales. You need to sit down and determine what sales do I think I can do over this period <clears throat> and work back from there to determine how much stock, therefore, do you need to buy. And the quickest, simplest way to do that calculation, again, is using a sell-through. And, and just... It, because again, sell through is such a um, an easily an easy measure to um, conceptualize. If you want to have eighty percent of your stock gone over a certain period, then you're aiming for an eighty percent sell through. And so you can you can just do that little calculation to figure out how much do you need to buy. If you overstate your sales expectation, if you are over ambitious and and too um, hopeful about how quickly you're going to recover or um, what the potential of your sales might be, you risk overstocking your business and, and creating a whole new problem um, with, with your brand new range and your brand new offering. And even though that product might have been really good product and great handwriting, if you just had too much of it, you hurt it. You hurt your brand and, and you undo a lot of that good. So starting with a realistic sales uh, plan, I think is absolutely critical. And um, being realistic, excuse me, as well about your stock. We touched on this earlier. When you work through the stock that you own and understanding what that stock represents at different stages, it's vitally important to be honest with yourself about its true value. Because when you come to, to try and drive your business and make sales and be profitable, if you have not been honest with yourself about the real worth of your stock, you won't have gone and invested in enough new product to drive those sales. You're, you'll get a false read. Your stock will say, I've got enough stock to do the sale, but when you try and do them, it won't happen or it won't happen profitably because your stock just isn't healthy enough. So you really have to be very, very deliberate when you evaluate that stock. 
I hope that concept is making sense. Um, then just taking a balanced approach. Um, so not only looking at sales, but also looking at profit, you know, turning hollow sales isn't going to cover your, your expenses in your business. So um, I do find in a lot of businesses, you know, they might have some little sales reports that they're looking at and, and some things that they're working through, but it often is only sort of rowing with one oar. And so you're just going in circles. You need to row with both oars. You need to be looking at sales and profit and making decisions based on that. So by profit, I mean margin in those individual items. Um, looking at what is driving your sales and what is bringing home the profitability and um, and also taking a dollar and unit approach. You, you want things that are, are driving the dollars, but you also want to be mindful of, of what's um, turning the units for you um, and, and understand the, the margin dynamic of why. Um, I've touched on strategy. I think it's vitally important, even though we're in uncertain times, strategy is still really, really important because it sets that roadmap. It defines where you're trying to go. It gives you, um, it helps you define priorities. So when you're trying to make choices and there will be choices to be made, it will help you hold them up against that strategy to go, which one gets the money. Um, if you're not clear on your strategy, when it comes to making choices in your range and, and other decisions, you'll struggle to make them because you just don't have a benchmark. You just don't have a way to clear away the clutter and zoom in on what really matters. Um, but having a strategy doesn't mean being inflexible and that's where scenarios and staying fluid is so important. Having lots of little scenarios, lots of little what ifs. Here's my stock profile. If we, if we reopen then, what does that mean? If we reopen a little bit later, what does that mean? Um, if I have delays with getting my stock um, flowing through in spring, what will that mean? Um, and then staying fluid, doing little bits more often. So, um, you know, if you can bring your stock in maybe in smaller, in smaller bites, it'll let you preserve your cash for longer. If you, um, if you have stores allocating your stock, holding back a little bit um, more than you normally would, so maybe, you know, businesses would allocate their stock out on an 80-20 type principle, push out 80%, hold 20% to react to where it's working. Maybe you go with a 70-30 so that you can get a read quicker and respond to that and send the balance out to where, you, where it's really working and, and not be left with those remainders that are unproductive. Um, even with markdowns, it might be that you take, um, you know, little tweaks early on and try and, and get onto that sweet spot of a price and, and move through your stock quickly because moving through your stock means turning it back into cash and, and reinvesting it. Um, and where you have the option to, and I'm not sure whether it's as fe feasible um, in your segment of the market, um, but test and respond. So trialing things, you know, if you get the opportunity to put something out there and get a quick read on it and then go double down, go do it. Um, as much as you can get a, a little trial going and get little reads before you have to actually commit, uh, bigger volumes is worth doing. Um, Okay, so another little pause point there. We're almost done. I've only got one or two more slides left. Um, are there any questions that anybody wanted to run through on those topics we've covered? Monitoring the chat box. Okay, so I'll move on. Um, oh, people, you don't have so fast. Um, I said, are you, yes, you said you used, was that directed to me, you used three measures? Ah, sales minus stock. Yes. So, yes. So when you are analysing, this was a question about the mixed percentages. Um, I think this is a question about the mixed percentages. Can everybody see the chat? Yes, okay. Um, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, when I was referring back to doing that mixed calculation, the percentage contributions, um, I was saying to do it across how your sales are tracking, how your stock is um, sitting and what margin you're making. So um, when I was using the example of um, applying it across color, for example, uh, you might find that you are doing 60% of your sales out of black and a further 20 out of blue and yellow, for example. But then if you take all of those SKUs um, or styles again and you, instead of doing that percentage contribution on your sales, you do it on your stock holding. So you go, how much stock do I still own of black, yellow, and blue? 
and calculate what is that percentage contribution, you might find that your black stock holding is actually only 40% of what you own, which would mean that you are selling black, at, your sales are comprised of 60% and your stock is made up of 40%, which suggests that your sales are overperforming in black. And then the third metric is on margin. So again, you look at of what you sold, what percentage mix is coming across those different colors, and that will tell you which one's driving profitability the most. So within that, for example, maybe you had already marked down yellow because it was a little bit slower. When you take that mixed contribution across the sales, the margin, and the stock, um, you'll get that read as well, where maybe from a volume point of view, yellow has pumped through a little bit more because it got marked down, but actually when you look at the profit that it generated, you'll see that that was part of why that happened. And you can do that same type of calculation across lots of different attributes to really carve up your range and understand what's working for you. So sleeve link was another example I gave there. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so the last one then really is just reminding you that your, your stock is either your greatest asset or your greatest liability. And so in many respects, I think it's your greatest attention um, because not just in a crisis, any day your stock management can make or break you. And um, so the focus really has got to be on ways to turn it back into cash, prolong its life um, or prolong its value and um, managing that stock to manage your cash flow to create OTB, uh, open to buy for the upcoming period. Um, and, and how well, again, under any circumstances, how well you measure, manage your, your stock is, is a direct precursor to your profitability from our perspective, from a planning perspective. Um, and at, when you work through some of the things that we've talked about in the session or that I've talked about in the session, um, you might land up in a place where, where you realize you actually won't be able to have enough cash to, to put together your next collection or um, you know, to navigate through, in which case you might need to look at financing options to bridge. But at least by working it through and figuring out where you're at and where you're trying to go in terms of your stock management and what your ranges are going to require and how you can um, approach things in a little bit more of a, a lean way of thinking, at least then you can identify, are you going to need some bridging finance? Are you going to need to do some other things differently? Are you going to need to address some costs and expenses in your business? Um, but I guess that's what it comes down to is, is having that plan, working through some of those scenarios so that you can get on the front foot with it and take just a little bit more control. None of us are really in control at the moment. I wish I was giving you a happier talk. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, hopefully there's some things in there that will, um, yeah, just stimulate your thinking and, and maybe um, help you strategize um, some ways through um, based on a plan and, and various scenarios. And um, yeah, maybe maybe what we'll be able to do is, is create a whole new hashtag where so last season means something really, really positive. And it'll be very trendy and cool in the new season to be so last season. And um, all of you will be able to still sell everything you've got. Um, because the customer will be ready to be a little bit more um, <laughs> supportive in that space. Um, so that was everything that I had um, set out to cover today. And um, yeah, so just um, thank you for listening and thank you for engaging and sending me your notes and comments. And um, yeah, I, I'd love to stay connected. Um, there, not that you can click on any of those things, but we're on all of those platforms and uh, I put out a lot of free content and um, so I'd invite you to connect with me on LinkedIn and uh, we're ramping up our YouTube presence at the moment with, with educational videos and, and talks and so on. And um, I'll be launching, launching some training courses shortly as well. Um, so yeah, love to bump into you out there. And thanks so much um, to, to Australian Fashion Council for inviting me to chat and, and putting all of this together. And I hope I've, I've added some value to your thought process. <laughs>